Hey, what's up everyone? I'll trade you here. And today we're going to be talking about Disney's Lorcana. I want to talk about why people underestimate this game from an MTG player standpoint. And I want to show arguments that prove otherwise, that the game can be challenging, complex, deep, and fun. I think a lot of people aren't talking about that aspect of the game right now. And I want to highlight why this game can be so huge. So I want to begin by talking about the pedigree. Then we'll go into the art, the collectability of the game, the design, the mechanics, the complexity of it, its staying power and, and you know, the hype behind it. So the pedigree of the game is uh, basically it is, a, you know, it's a Disney IP. Disney is so pervasive in today's culture. We grew up watching Disney. We know the characters. Even if you aren't a Disney fan, you know who these characters are because it's so pervasive in society. You know Simba, you know Genie, you know Ariel, Aladdin, Mulan. You know all these characters, even if you aren't a Disney fan. You know Elsa, and the younger generation does too. There's a lot of staying power with this game. I also wanna talk about the people who have created the game. We have Ryan Miller, Steve Warner, uh, these guys have been working with Wizard of the Coast, Magic, developing iconic sets like Zendikar for many, many years. You know, a, a lot of other YouTubers have discussed that they know how to make these games. They know it from a balancing standpoint, they know it from a design standpoint, what makes it fun, what makes it challenging, what makes it easy to pick up. But I think a lot of people are looking at this game and they're thinking it's too easy, so easy that it's it won't be challenging, it won't be fun. We're gonna get into that. I want you guys to let me know down in the comments below what you guys think about this game, what, what you guys think about Lorcana. Is it going to be the next big thing? I would like to think so because this honestly looks amazing and it's so much fun. L let's talk about it from an, the aspect of the art and the collectability of the cards. Examining the cards that have been released so far, I think it's around 60. If you look at the art, it has a lot of fundamental aspects that make it appealing. The card layout is simple, easy to read, aesthetically pleasing. It has taken the minimalist approach. It's not full art. You know, it has the characters art on there. It has the description. If you look at the art itself, it has great composition, great movement, depth, contrast, focus. It has all the qualities that make art appealing, that make art look good, look beautiful. And I think these artists that are uh, illustrating for the game also have that in mind. And they, I think they've done a great job. And we can talk about the beautiful foiling that have been uh, released and, and shown to us. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they have secret alternate arts as well. I want to talk about the structure of the booster packs that come in, in Lorcana. They said there's going to be six common cards, three common cards, two rare, super rare, or legendary cards in non-foil. And those will be the two slots at the end and one foil card that can be any rarity from common to legendary. I think that's a great format. You, you, you will be getting the super rares and the legendaries in each pack. So you won't have any issues acquiring those cards and playing them having fun with them but also at the same time you do have that one foil that could be from a common to legendary and if you did want to bling out your deck you could do so they already do have a lot of variety of product uh traditional booster boxes you have the illumineers trove uh gift sets starter decks uh the lineup is pretty robust and it gives an opportunity for, for people to pick up uh the product that's best for them we can go ahead and uh, talk about design, the complexity, the mechanics of the game. Uh, and this is where I really want to uh, kind of dive deep, deeper into the game and the gameplay. Here's where the players of complex and interactive TCGs like MTG uh, might have run into an issue or doubts about the game and how fun it's going to be or how challenging it's going to be, how competitive it's going to be. Many of the mechanics from the cards spoiled so far can be attributed to a mechanic introduced in Magic. So 
We can start off with something like evasive. I believe evasive is on a card like, like Tigger. Evasive is akin to flying, fear, horsemanship in match gathering. It can't be challenged unless the other character has evasive. You have Rush on an item card in Lorcana, White Rabbit's Pocket Watch, which in itself is basically an artifact that taps and grants haste. Haste, very powerful keyword ability, and they have it here in the game as well. We have Shift, which is a level up mechanic, kind of similar to equipping or affinity. It allows you to play a, a character for reduced cost on top of the previous character that shares a name with it. It's kind of like evolving the character and it effectively turns the previous character into a newly summoned one. You also have uh, the challenger ability, basically a pump ability. It grants a certain amount of strength, which is the attack in Lorcana. You know, we also have Ward, which is damage prevention by way of removing the character from being challenged. Basically, the character can't be challenged if they have Ward. There's also Ramp. You have the Detective Mickey card where you put the top card of a deck as a resource. Even if it isn't Inkwell compatible, the Inkwell is basically the mana or the land of the game. The way it works is you basically have cards in your hand. They have a certain flourish symbol around the cost, and that tells you that they can be converted into mana. So that's how they solve the uh, the Mana Flood, Mana Screw type issue. And there are songs, which are basically sorceries. You have, you know, sorcery speed type lightning bolts that you can see in Fire the Cannons. You have a kind of forced exert on like the Elsa card. Exerting is tapping. So you exert a character and they become tapped. So they can't use their abilities that require tapping. They can't quest, which is how you win in, in Lorcana. You're questing for these points. You start at zero and go up to 20 lore, which is basically your life points. So you're gaining life or writing the story instead of chipping away at your opponents. So it's kind of a race instead of combat. You know, you can see how each and every one of these abilities are starting to add depth into the game. You have a bounce with Cruella if she's challenged and banished. You return the character to a player's hand. You can either use it on your characters or your opponent's characters, I believe. You know, they have targeted hard removal in the action, Dragonfire. You have a way to remove the characters without going into combat. You have targeted uh, enters the battlefield hard removals from cards like Maleficent. You have uh, tax windfall effects from cards like Robin Hood. You have Lord effects that pump your other characters when you satisfy a condition like shown on Mulan. You have tribal buffs like Hades has. You gain plus one lore generation for each other villain that you have. So it's kind of like a tribal buff. You have a card draw engine in Stitch. You exert a character that costs two or less when they enter the battlefield and then you draw cards. It's a huge card engine. In the uh, bodyguard ability, opponents must attack the bodyguard if able. So it's a way to protect your other characters. You have summoning sickness in the game. It brings another uh, element to it where a possible line of play could be, you could use Elsa to exert a freshly summoned character. It doesn't allow your opponent or you to kind of combo off on the turn that something is played unless you apply haste to it or, or uh, rush. You know, there's built-in multiplayer. Uh, it emulates what makes Commander the number one format in Magic Gathering. I think that's great. It says in the rule book, like there's no limited amount of players, although it is primarily a two-player game. So the game can be picked up quickly, but it allows for higher level play to exist and be interesting and fun and challenging. And that, in my opinion, is a perfect combination. All the archetypes are present in the game. You have aggro, ramp, control, combo, mid-range, and the game has staying power in my opinion because you know, the creators have stated a uh, strong will to basically have organized play. Players are encouraged to go out and play the game. The hype is crazy. The community really cares about putting the game out there and having people see that it's just not a money grab or I'm super hyped. I'm going to be releasing more content when, when Lorcana is released. I'll definitely be cracking packs and opening boxes and just having fun and having gameplay out there, visiting my local game store, uh, you know, hopefully getting a product from them, being able to play it there, having an opening there. So I'm really excited. If you guys are looking forward to uh, more of that content, you can go ahead and subscribe to me. Please like the video if you like the content. This is I'll trade you. Thank you guys for tuning in. Peace.